is really a pilgrim person. She has lived several times, several different times in Ohio, several different times in Missouri, several different times in Alabama. Uh, she's lived in Maryland, she's lived in Massachusetts, and currently she lives inside the Beltway in, uh, in Washington, D.C. So she's truly a pilgrim people, all by herself. Um, she's, uh, she uh, holds a, a degree in theology from, let me find it here, uh, Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, she currently serves at, at the USCCB as the Director of Education and Outreach for the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development. Um, she's also, uh, at various times in her life, worked with the Glen Mary Home Missioners uh, and, um, and, uh, and the family uh, of organizations supported by uh, St. Vincent Paul in Atlanta. She served on a number of editorial boards and uh, for weekly publications. Um, her work in social justice is, is voluminous and uh, way too way too voluminous to, to really detail here, but uh, when I spent some time with her last night, then where is she? Uh, it was a pleasure, and so you're in for a treat. Susan. inviting me while I'm being mic'd. Um, and I just want to say, just this is my first time in Idaho. This is my first time, obviously, in Boise. And um, I really appreciate the welcome. Before I got here, I had a chance to, to try to better understand.
and I know we didn't go through the whole uh, framework, but I'm hoping that this will be a way to honor the fact that when there is a meeting like this, part of what we need to have happen is that you need to have some sharing with each other, right? <clears throat> you need to continue to get to know each other better, and I hope the two questions I'm going to ask you to consider at your tables will help that as well. So, who in the room, if you just wait, raise your hand, who, how are our, where are our priests in the room? Would you raise your hand? Priests? All right. Permanent deacons? Permanent deacons, we have a bunch of those. Um, staff of the diocese for parishes? All right. How about volunteers? People who are primarily volunteers. Right. And I'm going to get to this later. How many members of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul do we have in the room? Any? All right. Anyone else? Oh, all right. A couple Vincentians. The fam Vin. Right? There's a lot of parts of the Vincentian family. And how many of you think of what you do in the parish, what you do uh, for the diocese, what you do as a volunteer, as a vocation, as a call. All right, that's great, that's huge. All right. So I'm going to talk about some practical things as this goes on. But I wanted to start off by telling a story about something that I believe is about call, about how we're all called but it's also about the mystery of how we're called. Because there's a great component of mystery to how we're called. So a long time ago, um, long story, I became a reporter for a daily paper and I worked for the features department. And one time a month, every month, I had to do a food feature. A lot of newspapers do those on Wednesdays. And the food feature I was assigned was with a guy who was a firefighter. And he was a famous firehouse cook. And I had a terrible time getting the interview. So finally, Red Ferris was his name. He's a red-headed guy. <laughs> he said, I'm just going to come down to the newspaper. We can do the interview. And we'll figure out how you're going to come to the firehouse with a photographer. And I'll cook and you can take pictures of the food and I'll give you the recipes and we'll eat the food and all that. We'll do that later, but I'll just come down for the interview. So he came down on a Friday afternoon and we did the interview at the newspaper, which was very unusual. And after he talked about the cooking, he just kept talking. And I thought, I don't have an assignment right after, so it's Friday afternoon, that's fine. And suddenly he jumps up and he says, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to go to this dance in Kansas City. We're in St. Joseph, Missouri. This is all happening in St. Joseph, Missouri, which is the northwest Missouri. It's the little crook in the Missouri River, that little carve out. It's north of Kansas City. That's where we are. I'm in St. Joseph, Missouri. And you're going to I got to get to Kansas City. I'm going to be late. Got to get cleaned up. Got to go to the stamp. So on Sunday morning, this is happening on Friday afternoon, on Sunday morning I get up and get my own newspaper that I work for off my front porch. And on the front page is a list of casualties from the Skywalk collapse at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City. Do any of you remember hearing about that ever? <laughs> and there's his name. The Skywalk collapse at the Highest Regency Hotel involved the pancaking of, of walkways across the big open um, entryway. There were 1,600 people present, and over 100 of them died, and over 200 of them were seriously injured. The rescue recovery effort took 14 hours. It involved hydraulics. It involved chainsaws, uh, it involved bulldozers. Until the collapse of the South Tower at 9-11, this was the most deaths from a structural collapse, a structural uh, failure in the history of the United States. 
I think that if Red Ferris went home and got cleaned up and then drove an hour and a half to Kansas City, that I was the last person that Red Ferris spoke with in his life. The skywalk collapsed at 7 o'clock. When he kept talking after our interview, he reviewed his entire life. He talked about things that he regretted. He talked about things that he would like to be forgiven for. He talked about things that he now felt he understood better. He talked about things he was grateful for. He talked about things he wished he had done differently. And he talked about these things across his entire life and relationships, from family to professional to the mayor of St. Joseph. And to this day, I don't understand how that happened. And I don't understand all the quirky things, like coming down to the newspaper on Friday afternoon and the timing and all those things were very unusual. But I just want to say that we, we will work on some things today about call and invitation, but the Holy Spirit, there's a plan out there that we just see little pieces of, right? One of the things I love about the cathedral in St. Louis is it's all mosaics. And part of being part of, of the community of the Catholic Church is that we're each we each have our place, right, in the big picture. And, and we don't necessarily see the big picture, but the Holy Spirit does. So here's something very familiar. It was just Trinity Sunday, right? We're still in the week of Trinity Sunday. We're talking about baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Does anyone recognize this? Can you see it? So this, this is part of the, the rite ritual for baptism, right? It's familiar. And most of what I'm going to say in this presentation is going to be familiar. But this is an opportunity to revisit some things, right? Maybe to see some things in a new way, to take a pause and, and, and re- Examine uh, some of the things that are, that are very familiar. I know I just bought a car. I got my last car to last 13 years. I didn't pay attention to a car ad for 13 years, but when I needed a car, all of a sudden I'm paying attention to car ads, right? So I hope part of what we'll do today is like that. When you're ready for something, it bubbles up. So whatever bubbles up, even as familiar, <clears throat> is what, what we need to deal with. So again, all are called to discipleship. All are called to love God and neighbor concretely. We're all called to unity in Christ, to community, to communio, right? Because we're one in Christ. And we're so glad that he will be with us, which we also heard on Sunday. Postcards, the postcards on that table are for you to um, articulate questions. If, if as, as Susan's talking, if there are questions that occur to you that, that you're afraid you won't recall when the talk is over, you have those, those opportunities on the table, the postcards, to, to jot your questions down so that you'll uh, remember them and we can even collect them and, and, and ask them for you if you don't feel like standing up in front of the group. So we're called to be salt for the earth and light for the world. And this means at home, as individuals, in our parish work, in our neighborhoods, 
everywhere we are. This is one of the big challenges. How do we integrate our faith into who we are at all times? How do we not be salt that stays in the salt shaker, right? How do we not be the light that's under the bushel basket? Because in that mosaic, we need everybody's light. We need everybody's salt. We need the salt to be, to be out there. We need to show and share the good news. So I want to tell another story of another secular job that I had. <clears throat> I was a, a manager, co-manager of a restaurant at one point. And after I got off work, one of my fellow managers said, do you have any time after work? I want to talk to you about something. She knew I was Catholic. She was not Catholic. And it turned out what she wanted to talk about was she was considering having an abortion. She had a, an unplanned pregnancy. So she tells me this. We go to this restaurant. She tells me this. And we talked for hours at the restaurant until the restaurant closed. We had to leave. And when we left, I drove. I saw it had been raining when we went into the restaurant. When we came out, it was ice. It was snow. An unforecasted blizzard had happened when we were in the restaurant. And when I left the main road, the restaurant was on, my car just started sliding off the road. You know, roads are crowned so that the water runs off. Just that crown, there was enough ice, my, my car kept slipping off. It was very late at night, the blizzard had been going on for hours, and I was completely by myself, and my car kept sliding off, and I'd drive along the side of the road, and it would, I'd get back up and slide off again. Do you have blizzards in? And I don't know, oh, yeah, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. And the wind, like, you know, you're trying to look, and the snow is like, and you can't even see, and your eyes are watering, and it's pitch dark. And, and it, I was like, what am I going to do? And these two guys I'd never met in my life drove up in a Jeep. And they pushed me off the road, and they drove me through all the abandoned cars to where I lived. And the whole city was shut down for like three days. So again, strange opportunities for rescue now. And this story is sad because I was rescued, but the baby was not. Um, but again, uh, how do we, things happen that, we, that we're called in ways that, that aren't planned? So more than 20 years ago, the U.S. bishops wrote a document called Communities of Salt and Light. And with no support, no follow-up, nothing going on for most of that 20 years, that document, there are copies over there on the table, and your um, Hispanic ministry director has the last two copies in Spanish. Um, it's just been reprinted. It sells thousands of copies a year after 20 years with no advertising, no, no support. So it was a project of my office to do, redo the toolkit for Communities of Salt and Light. And to do that, we're not going to do a, like a phone book, right? Nobody even has phone books anymore. It would take that much. There's been so many things done, so many resources developed. It would be a phone book. That's impractical, and it would be obsolete the minute it was published. So we're going to figure out some way to do a toolkit. But one of the things that's not commonly thought of about this document, has any, does anyone remember the document? We're talking 20 years now. Yeah. Um, most people think the document is about building a social justice committee at your parish. And, and it could be used for that, but that's not what it's about. The document is about how you integrate, how we integrate all aspects of the parish, just like we want to integrate our faith into all aspects of our life, right? So how we pray in the parish, what we learn in the parish, how we reach out within the parish and outside the parish, Jack's comment about Jesus on the road, that those things all inform each other, and they all are consistent, and they all build each other up. Does that make sense? That's what the document, Communities of Salt and Light, is about. So I think Jack says it's about gathering and sending, and so I like an even simpler image than that. The parish life is about, this is the Holy Spirit, Ruach, Numa, Spiritus, breathing in, this is the gathering, and breathing out. So the integrated parish is, is as basic and important as breathing in and breathing out in terms of our faith and how we live our faith. 
<clears throat> now, you all have a unique understanding of this because you are a mission diocese, right? So, you understand that evangelization is, has a huge impact about how we live in the world, who we invite, who's part, who's included. And this is why. <clears throat> the church teaches that social justice is an integral part of evangelization, a constitutive dimension of preaching the gospel, an essential part of the church's mission. We cannot proclaim a gospel we do not live. We cannot carry out a real social ministry without knowing the Lord and hearing his call to justice and peace. Some people talk about the cross in terms of the vertical dimension, the prayer, the relationship with God, with Jesus, and the horizontal dimension, what we do in the world, how we treat each other, how all of that is about who we are, encounter with Christ in the Eucharist, encounter with Christ in other people. So when we do this, we look at those wounded people, the suffering people. We look at short-term ways of helping. We look at and long-term ways of helping. We look at individual situations. We look at communities and whole groups, how groups are affected. We look at, at helping people in emergency situations and at helping people in terms of systemic problems and challenges. <clears throat> So there's this document called the Program of Priestly Formation. How many people have heard of that? All right, I, I stole this quote from the Program for Priestly Formation. And it's about, again, about integration. <clears throat> the movement toward unity of life draws together and dynamically relates who we are, what we do, and what we are about, our purpose or mission. The readings today are also about this integration, right? The reading from Tobit. Tobit's wife calls him on how he behaves one way in one situation, he behaves another way with her. Um, and we also have the Caesar's coin in the gospel today. Jesus' tricky answer to the tricky question about who gets what, what's Caesar's, what's God. He doesn't really give an answer, does he? It's a difficult, challenging landscape. Last week, today, I was in Columbus, Ohio, at the annual conference of the National Association of College Seminaries, which means rectors from college seminaries from all over the United States. Was there a representative here who was at that meeting by any chance? Okay. So I was there to lift up the integration of the four pillars of priestly formation, which are human, spiritual, pastoral, and intellectual. Again, integration. Now, the basic norms for formation of permanent deacons has something similar called human, spiritual, doctrinal, and pastoral. I'm sure Richard knows that backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. The keynote at this meeting was by Archbishop Wong, who is from Merida, Mexico. He's the secretary for seminaries for the Congregation for the Clergy. So this is the universal church's way of doing priestly formation. And what he was talking about is changes, and I'd be happy to talk to people afterwards about this in more detail, but big changes to what's called the ratio fundamentalis that are going on in Rome right now. And those changes are going to emphasize integration. They're going to emphasize the interdependence of those pillars of human, spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral. They're going to emphasize formation of the formators, which is another aspect of what we're doing here today, right? They're going to emphasize how the formators need to model an integrated priesthood, those four pillars. And they're going to emphasize ongoing which in the PPF is called permanent formation. So again, as I said at the beginning, as we all know, this is a lifelong deal. So it is for priests and it is for, for all of us. 
<laughs> they even started, he started a, a class at the Vatican that he told all the rectors, any students they have in, in Rome right now, he wants them to attend this class, which will begin to orient them to the new Ratio Fundamentalis, which is all about this integration. So we've worked on this toolkit for communities of salt mine, and we've started it by listening. We listened for almost a year to people all over the United States from all different from parishes, from dioceses. We listened to permanent deacons, we listened to priests, we listened to people in religious life, we listened to people who volunteer or part of St. Vincent de Paul, Catholic charities, the major Catholic partners, staff, tons of people, campus ministry people. Um, the like um, evangelical communities like um, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. <laughs> anyway, we did a lot of listening for months and months and months, and we kept hearing this idea about everyone being called, about integrating our prayer and our action. We also kept hearing about how polarized everything is. So what do you do about that when people are like hunkered down? So we talked about what, what would a pastoral paradigm look like that would help people? How many people are familiar with the pastoral paradigm from the 50 C Judge Act? You ever heard of that? C Judge Act? Okay, so we heard some criticism of C Judge Act, which is C Judge Act doesn't talk about prayer. It's like what happened to prayer with C Judge Act? Also, you can do C Judge Act completely in your bubble. Right? I look over there and I see somebody, I think this is what they need, so I send it over there. Does anyone remember when we, we uh, dropped peanut butter from the sky over Afghanistan to people who were hungry? Like, I would love to know what happened to that peanut butter. Like, if you've never seen peanut butter in your life, and somebody, peanut butter falls out, would you wash your hair with it? Like, what would you do with it? <laughs> So we came up with a what we think is a Pope Francis messy pastoral dynamic for this toolkit called Pray Together, Reach Out Together, Learn Together, Act Together. And you notice the reaching out comes early because if you don't reach out, you don't you're not going to know what to learn. And when you reach out and learn together, everyone is going to learn something new. And you're going to be building something new right there. And then when you decide, when you do your discernment about how to act, and you act together, it's going to be a completely different thing than if one or two people act out of their familiar space. Does that make sense? Would and you again, repeat those before? Um, so pray together, reach out together, learn together, act together. Thank you. All right, so, oh, and I will, by the way, this new website is debuting right this second <laughs> in Boise, Idaho. <laughs> when we encounter Christ in the Eucharist, we are transformed in love as members of a community. We are sent as disciples to encounter Christ in the world, to pray together, to reach out together, to learn together, to act together. Transforming our world, our communities, and each other in Christ. We are communities of salt and light. We are salt and light. And there they are again. Today at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, my staff is serving cupcakes. <laughs> all the hundreds of employees there. 
because you've been to like events where it's not real unless they take a lot of pictures, right? Unless they give awards. At the USCCB, it's not real unless you have a cupcake party. <laughs> So the idea of these four is like the liturgical spiral, right? We keep, we're really doing them all at once, but we're maybe focusing on them one at a time, and we're going back through them again. It's like, like the shampoo instructions, you know? Lather, rinse, repeat. <laughs> repeat, repeat, repeat. <clears throat> so our, our Vincentians here, um, I think a great example of how this paradigm works is with Blessed Frederick Ozanam, the founder of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, a student in the Sorbonne in Paris, gets together with a discussion group, and at that time it was not great to be Catholic, it was not great to be religious, it was great to be purely intellectual. So he's challenged by the other students at the Sorbonne, and they say, so, like, what does your faith do? Like, does it, what does it do for poor people? And Frederick Gossenham goes, uh, well, um, the priests and nuns, they help poor people. And so the other students say, oh, so the priests and nuns live your faith, but you just sort of like stand back and watch or what? So that was an epiphany for Frederick Gossenham. He went home with his group of, of students, and they prayed together, and they reached out to Sister Rosalie Rondu who was ministering to the poor, daughter of charity, um, in the slums, in the, how many of you have seen Les Miserables? It was the time of Les Miserables. And so he learns from Sister Rosalie Rondeau about encounter, and about what works and what doesn't, and about how to be respectful, and about how to see the face of Christ in the other person. And he and his fellow students found the Conference of Charity in 1833. And as soon as 1845, it was big enough that it came to the United States, founded in St. Louis, Missouri in 1845. The Vincentians are sent out two by two. So once again, our theme of we don't just do this by ourselves and, and we're not alone. And the idea of the spirituality of the Vincentians is that, that it is more of a privilege for the Vincentian to be in the presence of the person in need. Whatever was done for the person in need, the Vincentian benefits more from the, the opportunity to see the face of Christ in those who are so close, um, so, so deserving of God's attention and God's love and our attention and our love. And many of them find that helping a whole bunch of people with a little bit of money, after a while, they start wondering if the relationship should be even deeper than what is seen in the home visit in that encounter. And so the idea of family uplift has really caught on with many of the parish conferences for St. Vincent de Paul. And that is <clears throat> encountering and companioning and being present to a smaller number of people, but seeing them all the way through the things that are the barriers. The next thing that happens, you know, the flat tire that means that you can't get to work so you lose your job, um, those kind of things. Um, and there's now the voice of the poor for the Vincentians, and they're looking at the systemic causes of things. So this giant landscape, I want to just focus us down into, into invitation. I've been invited into most of my ministry jobs, and I've been supported in those jobs and helped to, to um, learn the landscape, and then I've had people step back so that I could, I could do that work. And that's happened in my jobs, but also I've been a member of choirs in all those moves that Rich was talking about. So I've been in parish choirs for over 20 years, and that all started with somebody saying, hey, you can sing. You ought to be in the choir. And I've been in traditional choirs and contemporary choirs, and right now I'm in a multicultural choir. We sing in up to nine languages, and we sing in at least three languages in Latin every Sunday Mass. Um, so invitation is very powerful. And especially those of us who don't feel like we're at the core, or maybe we're not really that aware of our gifts, inviting is really, really important. So right now I want you to do your first table conversation. 
this is what I'd like you to talk about, and I'm sorry you only have 10 minutes. But I want you to talk to each other about who invited you.